Hello and welcome to Book or Two to Review 25 on the quarter of a century. And I've got off the Roman kick I was on. For now, more Roman books might be coming. And this book instead. Churchill's Admiral in Two World Wars. Lord Keyes, Admiral of the Fleet. Jim, by Jim Crossley. The officer who I maintain should have been made Supreme Commander Far East in about 19... March, April 1941 for all the naval forces and all the British forces out there. Because I think only if you had such a person in such a role who would be prepared to do the unthinkable and think the unthinkable, with a decent command staff, probably running it all, um, told to base it all in Salon, so he's nice and safe from any surprise Japanese attack, um, would probably have ordered things like the troops from Hong Kong transferred down to Singapore, The uh, all sorts of necessary decisions which should have been made. Anyway. The first things first, when looking through this book, I have one small issue with it. And it's one very small issue. The only colour in it is on the front cover. And yes, otherwise it's a gorgeous book, and I do love it, and I feel terrible picking up on them, but I know people like colour photographs, I know they like colour images, and I think it would have been, if you've got coloured in paintings, you could have done some paintwork of some of his battles, and some of the paintings of the battles that were, he was involved in. But that's not a reflection on the author. As I always say with these things, it's part of the publishing process. And I'm sure at some point a decision was made and they just went with it. And they've gone to some very stunning pictures as it was. But there you go, there's a black and white of the painting at the front. I mean, until I critique my own book, I'll probably be talking about the same problems on it. I will probably go not critiquing my own book. It's got maps in there. Maps of Tintin, of Tintin to Peking, uh, Peking, Gallipoli. And it's one of the interesting things. It's the first chapter, because that's the part of his story which is often forgotten. Roger John Brownlow Keyes. The name Brownlow, with its Irish connections, gives its clue to a clue to its origins. It was the name of his father's great friend, General Brownlow, whose roots, like those of Keyes, stemmed from a 17th century English plantation family in Donegal. Roger's farmer, Char a father, Charles Keyes, was a distinguished soldier. He was commander of the Punjab Frontier Force, keeping an other order among the unruly tribes of the northwestern frontier between India and Afghanistan. No stranger to action, and won the admiration of the Indian military establishment by saving a desperate situation in which he led a charge into the Barra Pass. <clears throat> Putting to flight a strong band of ferocious or um, Waziri warriors. On another occasion, he, together with a single junior subaltern and a handful of men, stormed up a steep escarpment to recapture a vital hill feature, scattering a large force of tribesmen before him. For both exploits, he was recommended for the Victoria Cross but it was not awarded. It is seldom remembered today what a significant institution the Indian Army was in those far-off imperial days. Much more numerous than the British regular army, it defended the British interests and supported the civil power in much of the southern continent. It provided an excellent career opportunity for an ambitious young British soldier of slender means, providing he managed to survive the Indian climate. Pay was better, and living cheaper than for an officer in the home country, and there was plenty of opportunity for fighting. British officers in the Indian survey, uh, service evolved as a kind of coterie of fighting men <coughs> who all knew each other, at least by reputation, and mostly maintained extremely high standards of loyalty, honour, and behaviour. 
In 1870, Charles Key, then a lieutenant colonel, had married Kate Norman, the much younger sister of Major General Norman, a hero of the Indian Mutiny. In doing so, he took on quite a girl. One of his junior officers, actually Ian Hamilton, who will feature later in this narrative, described her as high-spirited, fascinating, clever, uh, clever creature as I ever saw. Camel riding, hawking, dancing, she was the idol of the Punjab Frontier Force. Kate rapidly presented her husband with a family of four sons and a daughter. Roger, the second son, was born on the 4th of October, 1872, and Tundami, Tundiani fought in the Punjab. 1878 found this family embarked on a ship bound for England. Eventually, three more daughters and another son were to arrive, making a total of nine offspring. The object of the long trip to England was to find a reliable career for the older children in the home country so that they could be brought up in relative safety, away from the perils of Indian food and climate. The parents probably assumed at this stage their sons would follow their father into the army or in the Indian civil service. But young Roger, the second son, had already developed other ideas. Though he was a small and rather sickly child, he had already decided he wished to join the Royal Navy. Neither he nor anyone else knew what prompted this resolution. Perhaps he had heard something of the wonderful achievements of the naval artillery during the Indian Mutiny. Perhaps he had spotted and admired a naval officer's uniform at one of his parents' social gatherings. Certainly, he himself and his older brother had sailor suits to wear when he was only four years old. Maybe even something about the prospect of his long sea voyage impressed him. For whatever reason, his resolve was strong and unshakable. The Keyes family spent three years in England, then returned to India, leaving the five eldest children in the care of Uncle Edward. Not in fact any relation at all, but a country parson with a living in Norfolk, who made extra money by taking in families as paying holiday guests. Edward had two daughters who were put in charge of the Keyes' children's education and welfare. It appears the children were very harshly treated, in fact, and had a miserable time at the vicarage, the establishment providing few of the good things which had been promised and paid for by their parents. The redeeming feature was that the vicar was a great sportsman, and took the older boys on fishing and shooting expeditions, teaching them the rudiments of English country sports. He was a friend of the Earl of Leicester, who allowed him to fish in the ponds and rivers around the Hookham estate, very much the same territory as it happens, on which the young Nelson had learnt to shoot and fish roughly a hundred years earlier. In term time, the two eldest boys, Norman and Roger, were sent off to Albion House, a boarding school near Margate. Norman showed himself a bright and promising youth and achieved a scholarship to Wellington, a public school with strong army connections. Just before he, start to, he was to start his first stunt Wellington, disaster struck. He suffered severe internal pain, which was not recognised as appendicitis. After a few days' agony, he was dead. Roger, considered rather weak and a poor scholar, remained at Albion House in spite of the school being properly to blame for his brother's early death. He became a moderately capable cricketer, and his letters to his parents, carefully preserved by his mother, show some signs of a robust and determined nature, but also portray painfully poor writing and spelling skills. Typical dyslexia, which was an entirely unrecognised disability in the 19th century. This might be something I already had an inkling of, and um, may also feed into some of my admiration for Admiral Keys. Hey, us dyslexics have to stick together. We have to. Literally, no one else can read our handwriting. A letter written to his mother in India demonstrates a tenderness which was typical of Roger's good nature. Dearest mother, I wanted, I went to dear Norman's funeral. I saw his face. It was so lovely. I wish you could have seen it. His death was so sudden. It seemed strange that only the day before he died he was talking to me so happily. But it's not exactly death. Aunt Alice told me, you know we shall see him again in heaven. Aunt Alice has been very kind. She sent me some of dear Norman's hair. Has she sent you any yet? Do you think I can have a watch this birthday? We played cricket yesterday. I'm the, in the first 20 now. Poor mother, when you come home, we can go to dear Norman's grave. Your ever loving son, R.J.B.K. In 1884, to their offspring's relief, the general and his lady returned from India to set up a permanent home in the UK. The general wanted initially to live on the family lands at Krogan in County Donegal, close to Lough of in what is now the Irish Republic. He inherited a house there from his mother, which he intended to modernise and where he could live as a country general. Donegal, however, was one of the most inaccessible parts of the United Kingdom, and Lady Keyes quickly realised that it would be no place to bring up her eight remaining children. She was able to quash the General's plan, and the family eventually brought Shorncliffe Lodge, at Sandergate near Folkestone in Kent, a much more suitable location. Luff Swilly, however, did not cease to exert its influence. While visiting the family properties near Krogan, the Keyes were excited to see the great warships of the Channel Squadron anchor in the safety of Loth. General Sir Charles decided to pay a call on the flagship, Agincourt, and brought his rather unsatisfactory eldest son with him. Agincourt was a magnificent-looking, five-masted sailing frigate with an auxiliary steam engine. 
She had served in the Baltic during the Crimean War and had been very nearly wrecked recently off the coast near Gibraltar due to a navigational error. So there was plenty for the captain to talk to the general about. Eventually, the conversation turned to Roger and his determination to join the Navy. Don't let him, said the captain. Look at my watchkeepers. They are all elderly lieutenants. There is no future for them and small prospect of promotion. When next generation of sub lieutenants are promoted, they'll probably be ashore on half pay for a couple of years or more. There is no future in the Navy. The general's little son, now 12 years old, had it out that day. Roger's determination was unshaken, and the general at last wisely gave way. For a boy to join the Royal Navy in those days, there was a formidable hurdle to cross. The entrance exam was not too taxing. Some elementary maths and writing basic English would see you through. But first, you had to obtain a recommendation from a senior naval or political figure. The King's family friend, Sir Henry Norman, happened to know Lord George Hamilton, who was the first Lord of the Admiralty at the time. So with some exchange of letters, sponsorship was arranged. But the next hurdle was more difficult. The applicant's family had to settle an income on their offspring to pay for his training as cadet. The sum, typically £50 per year, equivalent to £5,000 a day, was unaffordable to any except the upper echelons of society. It followed that naval officers were predominantly drawn from a very narrow strata of the population, aristocratic folk who mostly knew each other and had the wealth to spare. The result of these entrance requirements were, as, as the performance of the Royal Navy was to show, unfavourable. The magnificent feats of the, in, of the Navy in the Polo Wars had attracted a degree of glamour to the profession, which resulted in it being dominated by an aristocratic officer class, mostly ultra-conservative, wealthy and resistant to social or technical change. Similar backgrounds and education resulted in a lack of initiative and an inability to think outside the box. There was no place in this rank for the rising, technically educated middle classes. Indeed, although there were engineer officers to look after engines, they were regarded with at best tolerance, at worst contempt by regular naval officers. They were debarred from the higher ranks of the service. It has often been observed that Nelson himself, son of an impecunious clergyman, would have been unable to join the Navy as existed in the late 19th century. His father would have never found the money. Most senior officers in the 1880s Royal Navy were fine seamen and would have been competent commanders of one of Nelson's battleships, or even one of Drake's. But in conflicts that would have come, dominated by mines, torpedoes, submarines, destroyers, and dreadnought battleships, skills and disciplines of an entirely new order were going to be required. Young Royal Job was joining a force with a glorious past but an uncertain future. He was to live through a change in the culture and the technology such as had never been seen before. The Keyes family were not poor, but they had seven other children to cater for, and finding money for young Roger was not easy. The next step was to remove him from Albany House and send him to Mr. Little John's, a specialist crammer at Greenwich, which brought backward boys such as Roger up to the modest standards required by Britannia, the naval training establishment. At Little John's establishment, a high standard of cleanliness and beha general behaviour was enforced by the formidable Miss Little, Mrs. Little John, the boys being required to dress for dinner and wash diligently behind their ears. Lessons were taught in the mornings by a young undermaster who took his pupils through endless past examination papers so that they knew the answers to most of the likely questions. Tougher were Mr. Little John's dictator sessions, dictation sessions after dinner. Dictation is always a nightmare for bad spellers, and Roger found them especially difficult. Often he was kept back after the others had been sent off to bed, and made to go on and on struggling with different wor difficult words, being roared with a smack across the shoulders with a cane or parallel rulers every time he had a mistake. Roger does not seem to have resented this treatment. Indeed, it was, instead, it was, indeed, it was considered perfectly normal time, and he seems to have liked and respected Little John. The teaching method was also successful. He passed the dictation exam with a few marks to spare and came 24th out of the 39 candidates passing into Britannia in his term. Roger had to face one more hurdle, a medical examination. For most boys, this is no problem, but besides being small and skinny, he had an arm which had been broken and badly set, which proved a handicap to him throughout his life. This would almost certainly have caused him to be rejected by naval doctors at Greenwich, but perhaps not for the first time in his life, he was to employ his natural charm and guile to outward authority. The doctor examining him recognised his name and told him that he had known his father in India. This gave Roger an opening, and he started a long conversation about India and the various family friends there. By the time the service had finished, the time allotted for the examination was over, and the doctor, unwilling to keep his colleagues waiting, didn't even measure Roger or test his eyesight. He simply scribbled four foot ten inches on the examination sheet and wished Roger well. He joined Britannia in autumn 1885 at the age of 13. This is a good book. It's not a massively thick book. And as I said... I would have loved slightly more colour in it. But that's mainly because, to me, Keyes is such a colourful character. But that would be the book I would write, and the book I would have done. Not, And that, uh, that's me, and that's no reflection on Jim. Jim Crossley has written a fantastic book. It is an excellent book. And it gives... 
a lot of through for Thorpe. You want variety coming through. You want a plot. Uh, you want a large pool of ideas. But one of the problems in this, you get even in the modern force, you get the people who join up. You don't get to pick who volunteers. Who volunteers is who you can pick from. Which does lead to all sorts of various ideas about what you should or shouldn't be doing. But the point is, really, you should always be promoting the person who is the most skilled for the job, most suitable for the job. The trouble is, again, and this happens when you shrink navies, especially if the Royal Navy is shrunk and most of the Western navies are shrunk. You lose command opportunities. You lose, especially the junior commands. Now, uh, the one of the reasons why I'm always fighting for the Royal Navy to have more OPVs is because you can give them to relatively junior officers to test out their skill in command of ships. You can give them to lieutenants if you want to. Let alone lieutenant commanders. You have enough of them. You can make sure every officer, before they get a solo command of a submarine, or even XO on a submarine, or XO on a major warship, has had to command an OPB. You'll go, there is arguments here. You can go, well, hang on, that's taking officers away from the submarine service. That's taking officers away from the fleet air arm. That's taking officers... And giving them, uh, you know, and pushing them into this, and how much time are they going to get? Well, that's why you need a sufficient number of OPVs. But I would a submarine officer, an officer who spent their career in submarines, a little bit of time in command of an OPV, where if you make a mistake, life is more forgiving. Before. they become anything else, could well be a safety trigger, a safety net. The same with a fleet air arm officer. The same with a ship officer, an engineering officer, anything rank. If they give the commands out to lieutenants, see lieutenants, before they become lieutenant commanders, go and get some experience. We want to see how you perform in charge of an OPV. Because that point, you can start to see from that level who is potentially the ones who are going to go through for Admiral. Because you're starting to look at that level, and especially with small forces, you need to think about this, for the long term. Most officers who join the Royal Navy, or any Navy, if they get through training, and they get the experience, can make a decent captain. It's very difficult to muck that up. But there's a difference between commanding a ship and getting the best out of an individual crew and getting the best out of a fleet or a task force or a whole expeditionary force. And yes, you can pass on this knowledge in some ways. You can give them staff experience you, where they can see senior officers in operation and learn that way. But you need to know who to be giving that experience to. You need to start thinking about it. If you can test them out young and in command, you can then start testing them out you know, when they start the older in staff and see who can take those roles on. Who can be the senior staff officers? Who can run the show when the Admiral or Commodore is busy? And it's better to find these things out in peacetime, in benign environments, than in wartime, when lives are on the line. A very, very good book.
worth a read. Link to Amazon down below, as is the ISBN number. Take care.